story we'll be watching unfold throughout the day, as will Mark Bailey from Fig Securities. Bonds in focus. Global bonds posting their biggest loss in a quarter century over the past two weeks. So what we, should we be watching in the week ahead? Um, Mark, welcome to the program. Simply put, are we in a bond bear market? Uh, good morning, Dean. I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think in terms of where we are and where we have been, if you look at the you know 30-year run that we've had in bonds, it's been absolutely exceptional. Now, is, is that over? Difficult to tell. I still think that the, the Fed is going to find it incredibly difficult to, to hike rates next year. I know there's all this talk about inflation coming back, but I just don't think that will actually come through, as we talked about last week. And as you rightly point out, yes, it's been the, the global bond routes, you know, over the last two weeks. But let's not forget the, the bonds in the global index have only lost 4%. 4%, okay. and, that, and, that, and that's it. You know, if, if you want to take an extreme in terms of the U.S. Treasury 30-year, that's lost 6% over the last two weeks. So, you know, in terms of, you know, the bonds in people's portfolios and the job that they do in terms of defensiveness, um, they, they're still there and they can still protect to the downside. Yeah. And, and not, and sorry, and, and just to continue, yeah. Nadine, there's also different ways in terms of bonds, and people get confused with government bonds. And we've been pushing, you know, maybe higher yielding, shorter dated floating rate uh, corporate bonds as well as another way to protect investors' portfolios in bonds uh, from this potential kind of upswing in yields that is likely to continue, especially in the long end. So bond markets and currencies in emerging markets, so even Mexico, Brazil, Russia, and other countries have been sold off along with U.S. Treasuries in the wake of the election. Emerging market debt ranked first last week in outflows as a percentage of assets under management. So what does it tell us, some of the moves that we're seeing in particular in emerging markets? I mean, is that a red flag? I think that's, that, that's very specific to the potential for Trump's trade policies and the impact or potential impact on the smaller emerging market economies and their export markets. You know, if, if basically the U.S. does kind of clamp down on imports and global trade and Trump is very focused on making sure uh, U.S. produces um, U.S. products, creating U.S. jobs, uh, at the detriment to the global economy, then that, then those are the types of sectors, those are the types of countries that will be more impacted. Now, whether that comes through, we're still in debate. He's still kind of forming his government, informing his cabinet, his inner sanctum, um, and we'll get those uh, details over the next couple of weeks. But in terms of you know, being able to protect investors from those types of uh, moves, then, you know, probably the higher yielding um, kind of uh, sub-investment grade corporate issuers out of Europe or the States or, you know, those unrated issuers out, out of Australia will still offer incredible value and will be to a large part fairly insulated from uh, potential moves in the Trump administration as he goes forward, whether it's trade or currency or, or whichever um, kind of uh, can fear he that is in the markets at the moment. So those types of due restrictions, I think, have the opportunity to benefit uh, in certain sectors as well in the States. You know, we've seen uh, kind of the prison sector in the States do incredibly well because Clinton hasn't got in and was going to kind of reform the private sector there. So there's um, very specific sector um, requirements that uh, are dependent on you know Trump's policies going forward and what he actually does okay so I understand then that you know it's very specific when you're talking about different parts of the market but there are you know those out there and very very vocal people who are saying that there is a great rotation from bonds to stocks happening now and that includes the chief global equity strategist at Jeffries or, or do you have to you know is he talking up his own book essentially I mean I, th I think you always have to look at the potential conflicts and potential wh where the person is standing. In terms of, you know, that switch into equities, I mean, I would potentially argue is now a great time to go in equi into equities. You've got rate, potentially rates rising, and if that happens, then it obviously impact some of the defensive infrastructure type assets that are uh, largely valued on uh, discounted cash flows of, of um, the uh, uh, risk-free rate. And in terms of where equities are in terms of valuations, you know, we had uh, the some U.S. markets hit in all-time record highs last week. You know, the price-earning ratios are at uh, pretty high levels, but you're seeing corporate profitability and in industrial production continuing to fall over the last two or three years. So what is driving the valuations in equity? So, you know, given where we are in the credit cycle, which normally takes seven or eight years to go through, and currently, you know, if you think we bust in 2008, 2009, we're getting towards the end, 
then you know potentially that equities and credit markets do deteriorate uh, at the same time, then the deterioration is likely to be significantly more severe in equities than bonds. And I would argue, actually, now is a time to move into a more defensive asset class in terms of bonds. Yes, granted, in terms of some of the longer dated um, bond issues, you will suffer some capital losses. But if you move into the shorter dated, higher yielding bonds um, you know, or some floating rate notes, then you are protected from any potential higher rates coming through. So I would actually probably argue now is a probably the time to do the complete opposite and move from more equities to bonds. And yes, you can argue I'm arguing my position uh, at, at FIG in terms of you know, where we are in the uh, cycle and what FIG does have to offer. But you know, I, I, I strongly believe that that's probably the, the positioning that the investors should be taking. And let's not forget in, in Australia, Australians are so far um, you know, in love with equities that their, their bonds and bills um, asset allocation in terms of their super fund on average is at 8%, which is the lowest in any OECD country with only um, Korea and Poland slightly higher. And then you've got Finland uh, over 30% in terms of allocations to bonds and bills. Mm. So I, you know, at the moment, I think you know, moving into equities is, is completely the wrong move, especially for the average Australian investor. Okay. Well, caveat, you are working for Fig Securities. <laughs> but before we let you go, Mark, um, I have to get your thoughts on what's happening in Europe. We have Angela Merkel confirming that she will be running again next year. And she is really billing herself as a beacon of stability in a very uncertain world, and in particular with a lot of uncertainty in Europe as well. Now, we have the Italian referendum happening on December 4th. That is going to start occupying more and more of our time and attention. Uh, if the Italian referendum is a fail for Renzi, does that throw the whole prospect of Europe up in the air once again? Is that really a death knell potentially for the EU? I, I, I don't think that specifically. I think it means, again, more uncertainty for Italy, which I guess in, in that instance is, is nothing new. I mean, what they're trying to do is trying to get a bit more stability in terms of the government, which we know changes uh, very frequently. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the proponents against that are saying, well, look, it makes the incumbent parties, the major parties, too dominant, too powerful. So there's arguments to both sides. But, you know, Renzi said if he doesn't get uh, the vote in his favour, he will resign. It would be very difficult for them to form government. So, again, it does throw Italy probably uh, again into some kind of election cycle again but there's you know there's also interesting elections that we've seen taking place in in France uh, in April May this year and at the moment um, you know, you'll see some uh, opinion polls with uh, the national front leader Marine Le Pen uh, out in front now it's really important that investors don't actually think that uh, she's the leading candidate because that some of those polls are without the Republican candidates which is likely to be Alan Jupp uh, in terms of uh, the opinion polls and when he's actually included, she's in second place, but she's likely to be um, in, in t through to the second round if it does go to a second round vote. So, but the, this, this move to the right wing, as we've seen with the Brexit and the Trump uh, kind of uh, wins there for kind of the right wing, the change party, the anti establishment parties, that is going to continue to sweep uh, through Europe. Uh, and I think we'll li likely to see that probably um, in demonstrated in Germany, you know, where against Merkel, you know, you've, you've got the AFD, um, you know, alternative for Deutschland um, kind of riding fairly high in opinion polls. I think it's number three from a, a fairly late start in terms of being a, a new party. So that's that swing and I think it's going to lead to more volatility, especially in Europe, but more, more globally. And let's not forget that, you know, talking about Europe, we're, we're kind of ignoring the, the bad bank situation, which is likely to um, hopefully have some kind of resolution this week with a bad bank set up from Monte di Paschi to Siena. Uh, and then also, obviously, the, the um, issues that we've had about Deutsche Bank and its capital levels over the last uh, couple of months as well. So, you know, I think there's going to be additional volatility, which unfortunately Mar Mario Draghi and the ECB are going to have to deal with and try to continue to stimulate, mm -hmm. stimulate uh, Europe. And, that, and that's what they've said they, they were going to do on Friday as well. Well, so again, you know, Europe is a key risk, uh, key political risk uh, out there, especially moving into next year and uh, you know additional elections, which could uh, throw investors out. So I guess in a more volatile environment, again, you know, investors should be assessing their risk. Uh, portfolios and risk profiles and potentially moving a bit more defensively uh, into, into those asset classes that can offer um, some good downside protection. Okay. Mark Bailey, thank you. Covered a lot of ground. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dean. Mark Have a good Bailey one. there from Fig Securities. Taking a short break when we return, Deloitte forecasting a 24 billion.